Hey guys, it's Trafflington. You know, I complain all the time about Windows and Linux users, and if I had more money, I'd probably complain about Apple too. But today, there's a different breed of computer user that always gets me going. It's not the Windows stands, or the Apple fanboys, or the Linux losers. It's a problem that transcends all three of them. It's the self-hosters. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not against self-hosting. I self-host my own website using a VPS. But I do know for a fact that because I've self-hosted my website, and because of how outdated information is on the internet, the way I have configured my website is completely and utterly wrong. But what's more is I can't get basic 404 information without having to find a way to pipe cloud search certificates into my container and to get database files so I can have copies of them outside the container so that when I rebuild the container the database isn't destroyed and then I can have copies so I can migrate my data someplace else, but that's enough ranting. Before you actually start self-hosting anything, you're going to probably want to get a domain name. And that's what we're going to get into today. How to pick a domain name that's right for you. And building your presence on the internet and protecting yourself as you do it. Now, if you're planning on self-hosting, and depending on what you want to do during your self-hosting journey, be very cautious of the domain that you wind up buying. Domain names are broken up into three parts. And in this example, I'm going to use the domain example.travelton.com. My domain is Travelton is my name is anything between the last dots of a url and that's my domain followed by com which is my top level domain or tld and dot com is one of the most popular top level domains other examples include things like dot net dot org or other country specific examples like for example if you're in japan you might occasionally see dot co dot jp or if you're in india you'll see something like dot co dot in and some websites, especially if you plan on self-hosting, use subdomains. So in this example here, I'm using example. But if you're using something like Gmail, Gmail is different from Google Search, even though both Gmail and Google Search are owned by Google. And it uses the subdomain mail.google.com instead of cluttering up google.com. But before you go out and buy a domain name, there's a bunch of other catches too. <laughs> When you buy a domain name, especially if you're going to be sharing with other people or making it a public website on the internet, you're going to want it to be short and memorable because you want the experience of your users typing in your domain to be as easy and as slick as possible. Unfortunately, many of these domains have already been taken up already, or you have to buy them from a domain registrar for upwards of $15,000, and sometimes even higher. But we also don't want to buy domains that are too cheap, especially if you're planning on making a public website or using it for something like email, for example. Very cheap top-level domains like .xyz or .info are often blocked by Gmail or security services or banks because malware distributors often use it to deliver malware to other people. The price barrier is usually enough to keep the riffraff out, so, and the fee of paying for a website isn't that much in the long run. Now, lastly, we also want to be careful of double meaning, or the cultural meaning behind some TLDs. Now, for example, we all commonly understand that the TLD.gov, and for example, Whitehouse.gov, is commonly associated with government websites. But there's also more obscure TLDs that are used for specific things. For example, my Mastodon instance is vt.social, which .social is the TLD in this case for social media. In honor of Pride Month, let's say that if someone were to make a domain with the TLD.gay. Now, .gay you could use in this instance to talk about your identity, but it could also have the connotation of adult content. Or it could be very difficult to direct people towards because it's very different from the traditional TLDs that most people are accustomed to. So just be cognizant of the domain that you want and any unintended ter interpretations when you buy it. So now that you have the domain that you want to buy in mind, you gotta go out and buy it. But before you go out and buy it, there's more problems that we need to talk about. And it's largely due to protecting your privacy and your sanity when you get flooded with spam. Because what many people don't talk about is who is privacy. And who is is a public record of internet users and website operators. When you register a domain name, your domain provider is going to need a physical address or an email of the recipient to be publicly available. And the other thing to be aware of is your privacy when purchasing a domain. Because when you buy a domain, you're going to need to submit a real email address you control. 
And also, be prepared that the email that you make is going to be permanently associated with your domain forever. When you submit an address to a service provider, like a domain registrar, you want them to protect your address. But unfortunately, accidents happen, and registrars can often lose information. Years ago, the Linux YouTuber Luke Smith promoted Epic, which is a far-right registrar, but eventually Epic got hacked and leaked information about its users. This hack also included the who is information of Epic's users, which also included their addresses. But it wasn't just Epic's users, it was who is information scraped from other domain providers that weren't Epic as well. Now, if you had domain privacy on, to protect your information when this happened, you were safe. But if you were an Epic user, even if you had domain protection, your address is now out there on the public internet. Now I understand that while an incident like Epic it was a targeted case and definitely very rare, the threat of registrars losing your information or scrapers getting that information but how does someone actually go on protecting their physical address? It's pretty easy to go make an email account, but how do you protect your physical address? Well, I have two options here. The first is that you can use a commercial or municipal mailing box. Depending on where you live, you can pay for a second mailing address, or you can get it through your local government. But because my brain is too cooked, I chose to do something different from the mailbox altogether. And this is alternative number two, and I think this is a little easier. Every year, my family piles into a car, and we travel to a different part of the United States than where I live on vacation. We usually do this to visit family, go out and sightsee, all the stuff that you'd normally do on vacation. When I first registered my domain name, we went on our yearly vacation, and I created my account and bought Traffleton.com using hotel internet. And in the address field, I provided the address of the hotel that we were staying in and the room number, which at the time was my place of residence. And coincidentally, your registrar will frequently ask you to update your address every year. So even though I'm not buying domains constantly, I use my vacation as an opportunity to update the who is information with the new hotel of that year. And I believe this is as close as you can get to providing real and accurate information that would appease a lawyer while safeguarding your own and complying with the rules of the ICANN, which is basically the global internet body police or whatever. <laughs> the most important thing when we make domain names or create new accounts is to never lie. We do not want to break the law. The internet police won't come after you, but we need to be good patrons of these services. And you also don't want your account to be suspended. Now we have to talk about the actual provider that you pick. The first thing to analyze is the worst kinds of domain providers. And unfortunately, the worst case scenario here is also one of the most popular, and that's GoDaddy. Until 2022, GoDaddy paywalled who is privacy behind an additional fee. So that privacy that will basically hides your hotel address from the public internet, uh, yeah, you'd have to pay an additional dollar or something for that, which is stupid. They also offered managed hosting, which was also hacked because of bad security practices. Finally, GoDaddy also charges way more than their competition and provides substantially worse customer support. This customer support has also been exploited numerous times and had unauthorized domain transfers. And unfortunately, I have had the displeasure of engaging with GoDaddy support on behalf of other people. And they will demand that when you interact with them to turn off two-factor authentication while they work on your account, which is monumentally stupid on many levels. <laughs> And for the record, I have a domain that many people perceive as nonsense, but it's still an 8-character domain. It's an 8-character domain that's easy to type and is a .com top-level domain. That's already a struggle enough. The problem is the last registrar that I picked, which was Namecheap, always jacked up my rates every year. Namecheap also participates in the same sleazy hosting auctioneering tactics that GoDaddy does too, and many of the other providers like Porkbun and Bluehost do this as well. The domain provider that I eventually settled on was Cloudflare. Now I know that a lot of Linux losers are going to criticize me for picking Cloudflare, but the fact of the matter is, they are one of the few domain providers that will actually try to protect your privacy and security, and they actually have very strong security defaults, even if they're configured a little differently than what you'd expect from someplace else. Cloudflare isn't much
much better than any of the other providers. And Cloudflare also has additional concerns, being a company that controls a sizable chunk of global internet traffic and doing really weird non-standard proxy stuff with DNS settings and causing configuration problems with my server that don't exist on other providers. However, I don't have a better option, and the fact that they have remained true to their promise of not overcharging me or offering shady domain auctioneering deals like many of the other registrars do is also a big plus. Now, theoretically, let's say I were to quit YouTube and shut down all of my online activities that you know about anyway. <laughs> if I did, I would still have to pay for my domains because unfortunately, there's an industry of people who buy up domains the moment they are put up for sale or people stop paying for them. The most egregious of this is the potential scenario of your website being bought out and used to distribute malware or scam other people or being used as part of a botnet. If you are like me and own a domain for multiple years, your domain will build up credibility and reputation with malware scanners, internet search engines, and just from fulfilling what it usually does on the internet. Set up recurring payments with your credit card and know that it's another reason why it's so important to pick a good domain registrar. I chose a domain that I did, which is an eight character .com domain, not as just as a flex, but it's an asset that points to my content. And as a result, I will protect it accordingly. <laughs> The last cautionary tale is to not go and replicate what I did. See if it works for you, but do not let somebody tell you what to do online, especially if that somebody is a cartoon character who's been talking for way too long about how websites are ruining the internet. So if you like this video, why don't you go leave a like on this video? Leave a like on this video if you want me to engage more in the awful, awful world of self-hosting. And if you like to see some more about what I do, you can also visit the website that I mentioned in this video, travelton.com. If you visit my website, you can get a full transcript of this video, and you can also see some of the artwork that I do outside of video form. And that way, you can just read instead, or you can search every word that I write and haunt me for the rest of my life. As always, if you want to support the work that I do, you can give me money through Patreon, YouTube memberships, and cryptocurrency. And I would like to mention that there are two nice souls who decided to give me cryptocurrency. I don't know who you are, uh, but maybe you want to keep it that way. But I am always grateful for the support that all of you give me. And with that, I'd like to thank you for watching this video, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your week.